In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The parable that you just heard in our gospel lesson today from Luke chapter 16 is the parable of the shrewd or dishonest manager. And it teaches us at least three things. First, God is commanding us, especially in the first portion of this text, to be diligent and faithful with all that he has given us. This includes money, includes possessions, it includes our family, our spouse, our children. And not only that, it includes our bodies, our minds, the talents and gifts that God has given to us. And unlike the manager in our text, God expects us to use that which he has given us for his glory and for the benefit of those around us. Second, this text also teaches us that God expects us to use the gifts he has given us for our own spiritual benefit. This comes up in the middle part of our text. Just as the manager was clever and shrewd to provide for himself after he got fired, God expects us to be clever too, to ensure that we on judgment day will be blessed eternally. How do we do that? Let's discuss that. Third, God warns us in our text in very strong terms, especially at the very ending of the reading, the expanded reading that I read for you. He warns us against greed and the love of money. This is that horrible and monstrous vice that creeps up on us unawares. And the devil is constantly using it against all of us. And we have to be wary and guard against us, guard against it. Indeed, God tells us in stark terms, you cannot serve both God and money. So friends, pay attention carefully this morning as we consider our text and what God is teaching us with these three lessons. Let's all admit to ourselves right now that God has given us all very much. The greatest thing that he has given us is his pure word. So let's begin by being good stewards, by being careful and faithful hearers of his word. Here are the basic elements of the parable of the dishonored steward or manager. Both terms come up in various translations. A rich owner, rich business owner, it doesn't matter what kind of business he had. Remember, this is parable. But he had a manager who was accused of mismanaging and wasting funds, bringing harm on the owner. So the owner called the manager into his office and said, in so many words, what's going on? I hear reports that you are mismanaging my funds. I'm giving you a short time to turn in an account of your work because I'm firing you. The manager, worried about how he would live after being let go, got busy and went to his owner's debtors and cut a bunch of incredible deals. In one case, he cut the debt completely in half. And it's pretty clear in the parable why the manager did this. In this way, he'd have some friends after he got fired who would feel obligated to help him. Of course, Jesus explains in the parable that the owner found out about all that the manager did and all the deals that he cut. And while he got swindled, the owner, out of a whole lot of money, he could not help but congratulate the dishonest manager for how shrewdly he provided for himself. Now, be careful and understand right off the bat here that Jesus is not teaching us how to handle money in this text. He's using the world of finance to teach us a spiritual lesson. So again, don't take from this parable that you ought to go out and cut in half everything that somebody owes you. Um, if every Christian banker or businessman did these sorts of things, they would go bankrupt and cease to exist in a moment. Again, this parable is a word picture that's teaching us an important spiritual lesson, but Jesus is using the world of finance, which we're all familiar with, to teach us. And the first lesson is this. It comes off right off the bat. Don't be like the dishonest manager. After all, he still got fired even after these deals were cut with the owner's debtors. He shouldn't have been in such a place to begin with. He should have been a, a wise manager and used the owner's funds 
uh, to do good to begin with. And so we learn from our text then by negative example, by what not to do. And scripture does this all the time. This is what these people did. Don't do what they did or harm will come. And we get this from the Old Testament, even that's explained in our epistle lesson today. They committed idolatry, the Israelites. They rose up to play and committed sexual idolatry. Don't do what they did. After all, 23,000 of them were judged on the spot and killed as part of God's wrath. And then in the New Testament, we learn by negative example, don't imitate the Pharisees. Don't be like them. They can put on a great show of holiness and piety, but they're full of unbelief and rottenness of the soul. And so God ordered such examples in our text and elsewhere in Scripture that we would take notice of sinners in the past who have been warned and judged that we might not repeat what they did. Again, let's not imitate the manager. Let's use what God has given us, not on frivolous, self-indulgent means, but do with what he has given us that which brings God glory and benefits our neighbor. And friends, the fact is God has given us, each of us, more than we know. And we're taught to confess that God has given us so much in the first article of the creed, where we confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And especially in the catechism, Luther's small catechism, we're taught what this means. With these words, we are saying that God has created us and has given us all sorts of possessions, our bodies, our mind and reason, our family, our money and goods. So God then is represented in our parable as the great owner. And he's given us management over his treasures that he's awarded to each of us or given to each of us. And we're to manage and keep it and bring benefit to the owner. And so we have a really a frightening lesson in our gospel text today. God expects us to use all that he has given us, again, our money, our bodies, our minds, possessions to his glory and benefit and not waste them on selfish and lazy reasons as the manager was doing in our text. There is an accounting to come should we be wasteful with the owner's goods, God's goods that he has given to us. Indeed, friends, there is a judgment day, an accounting, as the parable puts it. Now, this certainly includes money, is, is made clear later in the gospel text, but it includes uh, the gifts of our bodies and minds. It includes the various offices and stations in life that have great responsibility or, or less. Some of you are engineers. Some of you may are students. Some of you are parents. Some of you are grandparents. Let's consider these offices and vocations that God has put us in and consider our responsibility and handle these gifts appropriately. In all these things, God expects us to do our duty that we might give him glory and benefit our neighbor. Oh, the shame, friends. Consider it. Oh, the shame of how we have used our money for frivolous and selfish and indulgent purposes. We have this natural tendency to think of our jobs and the money we earn as ours, to spend as we wish, and we so often spend it without thought of how it affects others or how it might bring glory to God or bring harm to the gospel. We covet this, we covet that, we buy this and we buy that, and yet our money is not our own. God grant us forgiveness for mismanaging the money that he has given to each one of us. Let's be careful about how we use our bodies and minds. Let's not use it lazily for bodily pleasure and mindless entertainment. O oh Lord, grant your Holy Spirit to use our bodies and minds in your service and in service to others. We also tend to think of our families as our own, to direct and, to direct and guide as we wish for the delight of seeing them succeed in life. 
but let's consider how to use our family responsibilities to ensure that family members are receiving God's word and instruction in it. Oh Lord, help us to fulfill our family obligations that you might be praised. Again, remember friends, you are just the manager of what you have responsibility over as family members, as government workers, as this and as that. And what you have, God can take away in a moment. God did it to Job to test him. It's not yours. He can do what he did to Job to you too as well. So let's take our gospel text today as a stark and sober reminder to be good stewards of what God has given us. Let's learn to ask ourselves, am I using my money, my possessions, my station in life, my responsibilities, my health for selfish reasons and selfish pleasure? Or am I being a good steward and using them for God's glory and for the benefit of his people, Christians, and for the benefit of my neighbor, whoever he is? Am I helping my neighbor in his need? Am I seeing to it that God's word is faithfully preached by supporting the church? Because this is how God greatly and most supremely blesses people when they hear the gospel, repent of their sins, and receive God's gracious gift of forgiveness. And so let's consider Jesus speaking to us in our text. I've given you much, all that you are and own. Be careful not to waste it as the dishonest manager wasted his boss's funds and was caught doing so. Rather, use them what I have given you for my praise, honor, and glory, and for the benefit of your neighbor. Yes, use the gifts that I have given you to put food on the table and clothes on your back, but then be generous to others and bless them with what you have. Especially be generous to God and his church that my precious gospel of the free forgiveness of sins might be preached here, there, and everywhere, and your fellow man be saved. Because this is what gives me the greatest praise, when people hear my word, repent, and believe in the Christ for their salvation. And so, friends, consider our text again as a serious admonition to use what we have been entrusted with for the glory of God and for the benefit of others. Now, there's a second lesson in our text that comes up in the middle. As I mentioned, Jesus means for us to actually imitate, in this case, the dishonest manager, when we see the dishonest manager's creativity and cleverness to provide for himself. I'm amazed how people of this world can cleverly use the rules and laws of our government to provide for themselves. And we ought to be just as clever, but, in, uh, but to ensure spiritual benefits for ourselves. And don't be fooled again, the dishonest manager in our parable was, was a bad egg. He wasn't a virtuous person. However, he was clever and wise for his own benefit because what he did meant that he was provided for after he would be fired. And we can learn something from him. And, and this is what we can say Jesus is teaching us. He said, he, he, he's saying, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal, into eternal dwellings. And, and to put it another way, you could say this, the manager was clever and industrious to provide for himself and make sure that he had friends and riches later in life. So should you and I be clever and industrious to make sure that we have friends and riches in heaven. So how does this play out? How can we use unrighteous wealth, that is actual money, actual possessions, the gifts and talents that we have, how can we use that to make friends who will receive us into heaven? And here's again what I believe Jesus means. I believe he means that we ought to use our money, possessions, time, and talent, talents to benefit fellow Christians and those coming into the faith that they then might have reason to boast about us and to pray for us and then on judgment day to boast about us all the more. The idea is then that those whom we have helped and benefited, benefited because of our generosity and love for others would be a witness and recommendation to our Lord to let us into heaven. 
consider what you do as a way to establish a great reference such that when God looks at your resume, he goes, huh, this person is boasting about you. This person has this good thing to say about you. This person has this good say about you. Think of it like that. Do good to others, friends. Bless them with what you have that they might not be in need and learn to praise God for his mercies. Again, you know, we're, you don't encourage laziness. Indeed, don't encourage it by what you do, but truly look to fulfill your neighbor's needs. Not only that, make friends with good, solid Christians. Make friends with decent pastors who will then pray for you and your salvation that you would keep the faith and be received into heaven itself. I do this for you. The more I see you fulfilling your vocations and doing good, the more I am encouraged, the more I praise and thank God for you the more I ask that God would be good to you and build you up in the faith and set you on the right path and that he'd forgive you your sins. In this way, I'm ensuring that you are received into eternal dwellings, as Jesus put it. Oh, so again, let's learn to be clever with what God has entrusted to us by being generous, helping others, making friends with good Christians and pastors who will give thanks to God and recommend us into heaven and build our spiritual resume. It's a strange thing that people of this world exert so much effort and display such cleverness to bring themselves selfish gain, worldly wealth and advantage, and yet we see baptized Christians be so lazy about things that will bring them eternal gain. Take note, take note. Thirdly, our text is a very serious warning against greed. This is taught in the parable itself. But it is especially taught in the extended reading, those last three verses that are provided for in our lectionary. And we get the warning against greed, you could say, twice. And, and here, let's be careful to note how easily money and possessions and goods can steal our heart and present themselves as worthy gods to worship, only to escort us into the fires of hell. Greed is a hidden sin that sometimes will display itself by how we handle our money, but it's, it's a hidden sin that we creeps up on us unawares that we have to be careful to guard against. Oh, how often people have started the journey of faith with a good conscience only to make a shipwreck of it by getting caught up in the allurements of wealth and feverish work to establish themselves and gain goods and possessions. Jesus spoke of this sad fact in the parable of the sower when he spoke of the seed that fell among thorns. Do you remember that parable? The seed that fell among thorns, it started to grow, but then it was choked by the thorns. And Jesus explains what those thorns represented the cares and riches and pleasures of life. That's how he defined the thorns. Oh, how careful we must be here in America, but everywhere really, but here in America where we see so much around us that bring earthly pleasures, bodily pleasures, but it can choke out our faith. It can kill it so that people fail to produce good works and nobody exists who will recommend them into heaven. Indeed, friends, the Apostle Paul warns us in the first epistle to the uh, Corinthians uh, that the greedy will not inherit heaven but will suffer God's eternal punishment. Guard against it. Keep your goods and your money and all that you have at a healthy distance from your heart. And consider God's word and ask that his Holy Spirit would guide you in wisdom with how to handle that which he's given you. And it's not as though you can be righteous and love God and allow yourself a little bit of love for wealth and possessions. You, you, you can't be done. 
It can't be done. You will either serve God and hate money or you will serve money and hate God. So may God forgive us our sins of greed. And friends, the gospel is this. He does in Christ. May God then send us his Holy Spirit that we would learn to be like Christ because Christ was not tainted with even a hint of greed. Rather, he was willing to give up everything. His goods, which he didn't have much of, but he gave up his tunic, as John explains, that was of some value that the Roman soldiers wanted. He easily gave that up, but he gave his only life up for you and for me. And in him, who was perfect, in him we are saved. In him we are forgiven. Oh, hallelujah, that in the gospel and in Christ, greed is extinguished. And our fails, failures to manage that which God has given us is forgiven. Hallelujah. This is enough for today. God is teaching us again in this text to consider ourselves as managers of all that we have and own. God expects us to use what he's given us for his glory and for the benefit of the church and the benefit of our neighbor. And God is also warning us, doubly so, to not be greedy or be a lover of money, but above all, that we would consider heavenly treasures, Christ himself, and seek to gain him, that we might be blessed with the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Peace of God that transcends all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.